Hey, so again, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're at right now. My name is Jake McSheffrey. I'm the business project manager at Project Solutions. We are the DBE supportive services provider for North Dakota, South Dakota, and Nebraska, which I'm sure you're all well aware of. Um, so we do a lot of these training and videos to try to help highlight some information that's modern into the current industry and you know, give you up to date stuff on how things are going. And particularly with this one, we're going to be looking at reimagined recruitment and retention techniques and how the labor workforce has changed post COVID and, you know, what, what it takes to be better at recruitment and better at retention and attack that war on talent. Um, and so I'm doing this presentation also with Elisa. Hi, Elisa, my name is Elisa Boza and I am a marketing and, uh, program coordinator with Project Solutions Inc. and work with Jake as well on all three of those DBE program contracts that we have with the three states that he just mentioned. So if at any point you have any questions, you can either put them in the chat or you can ask. Um, I believe you have access to your mics if you want to use them. Um, if not, just throw it in the chat and, and interrupt whenever and we can deal with it as it comes up. So we're going to be going over today, understanding the labor shortage. You may have heard the term war on talent, um, whatever you want to call it. Things have changed and we're going to discuss what those changes look like, the different perspective that we have to take now and ways that we can kind of overcome it. Then we're going to talk about the modern day construction industry because that has definitely changed over time. We're going to look at new strategies for re-engineering the recruitment process. Old strategies don't work as well anymore. So in order to you know attract the most talented, people that would be best for the jobs, there's new things we need to do. And then effective employee retention. Again, once you get those people on your team, how do you keep them? How do you keep them going from other companies or other industries? So understanding the labor shortage. We're gonna talk a lot about the labor workforce post COVID. What's important to understand is that these shifts in pay and flexibility and an emphasis on a better work-life balance were not a direct result of COVID. These shifts were already happening, but COVID expedited the process drastically, which is actually a good thing. Instead of having five, 10, 20 years of incremental changes in the workforce that employers and employees are constantly battling and trying to figure out what they want to do, we ripped the Band-Aid off and said, OK, we're doing all of this now. Everyone's got to either adapt or fail. Um, we can't fight the change because it's inevitable, and instead we need to focus our efforts on how we can better cater to our team and how can we demonstrate how much we value them at our organizations. So understanding the labor shortage, workforce participation remains below pre-pandemic levels. Three million fewer Americans are working today compared to February of 2020, and this is according to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And the latest data shows that there are more than 10 million job openings in the U.S., but only 5.7 million unemployed workers. So in other words, we have a lot of jobs, but we don't have enough workers to fill them. And in fact, if every unemployed person in the country found a job, we would still have 4 million open jobs. So how does this equate? How does this math work out? And there's a lot of economic practices that are at play, um, but some of the items are that a lot of jobs that were originally outsourced to different countries were brought back to the United States. The past few administrations we have had have been really big on rebuilding America and bringing jobs to America and have been successful in that, which has created a lot of work, but our population and the amount of workers we have hasn't really changed. So that's why there's such a big gap in that. Because of COVID, many people started new companies, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, um, but that all these new entrepreneurs and these new businesses started really affected the, the pool of applicants for the jobs that are currently out there. And then the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which is another training we're going to be doing later this week. So there's my shameless plug that if you're not enrolled in that training, it's another good one to sign up for. Um, that's a $540 billion bill that brought all types of new work for infrastructure and repair in the country. So that created a ton of work. In fact, it created millions of jobs. And again, that helped kind of extend that gap between the workers and the, the, the work that's available. So some additional factors that are keeping people from returning to work post COVID. Um, the US Chamber surveyed unemployed workers who lost their jobs and were asking them basically, why won't you go back to work? And these are the number one, two, three, four, five things that came up. Um, the need to be home for to care for children or other family members, having been ill and health has taken priority versus looking for work. Continued concerns about COVID-19 at work, pay is too low and focusing on acquiring new skills and education. So we'll break those down a little bit further. The need to be home to care for children, or other family members. 
anybody who has tried to find childcare um, or has worked with childcare understands that it's expensive. It's very difficult to find. There's usually a wait list um, to find reliable, trustworthy childcare is a problem. And when people didn't have their jobs and they became that childcare, once they started stabilizing their finances and started getting some other supplemental income, they realized that they didn't need to use that expense, that they could stay home and still supplement their life. So that's kind of been one of the biggest issues. Having been ill and health taking a priority, once people stopped working, they realized how much their jobs had a physical and mental toll on their health. And again, once they became stable with their finances post COVID, they said, I'm not going back to that environment. I don't need to go back and put myself through that mental and physical stress. There's still continued concern about COVID-19, the, the pandemic itself and the, the, the virus, but this also talks about how companies have responded to the virus. What practices have they put in place, whether it's sanitation or things that are related to the virus or business practices, such as flexibility with scheduling, hybrid work schedules. Um, that concern about COVID-19 and the effects of it, that's still an issue that people have in return to their jobs. Pay is too low is pretty self-explanatory. I don't think we need to go into that one. People realize, hey, I don't, the money's not worth it. Unless I'm going to get paid more, I'm not going back. And that also goes into focusing on acquiring new skills and education. So people have taken advantage of their time during the pandemic to learn new things and go back to school. Um, and now they're either still in school, still practicing those learning new trades, or they're taking what they've learned and starting a new business or starting a new job in a new industry for more money. Some additional factors are an increase in savings. So enhanced unemployment benefits, stimulus checks, not being able to, the inability to go out and spend money during the COVID for two, three years, depending on where you are. This all contributed to Americans collectively adding $4 trillion into their savings accounts since early 2020. So that's kind of where people said, oh, look, I have this money. I don't need the money coming from work or I can get the money from another source, another job, maybe a work from home job, things of that nature. We talked about the lack of access to child care, but it's it's worth re-mentioning because this is a major issue. Even before the pandemic, a lack of access to high quality, affordable child care was an issue, and it's only exacerbated after the pandemic. Entrepreneurship, new business starts. In the spirit of entrepreneurship, some employees either left work or stayed unemployed to open their own businesses. Over the last two years, nearly 10 million new business applications were filed. And in 2020 alone, there were more than 4 million new businesses started. So, you know, in this in this audience, we're talking to DBEs, we're talking to business owners. You understand that, you know, the benefits of starting your own business. Um, you understand how that's better for your own work life balance and everything as well. So a lot of people had that opportunity during the pandemic and they took advantage of it. And then early retirements as of October of 2021, not 2020, 2021, the pandemic drove more than three million adults into early retirement. So before we looked at that number where there was going to be 4 million open jobs if everybody took a job, well, 3 million applica or applicable workers are no longer in the workforce because they retire early. So it's no secret that the U.S. workforce has been rocked by systemic shifts in recent years, and it will most likely not return to pre-pandemic norms. It will not return to pre-pandemic norms. The company's workforce is changing, and we need to be aware of what is likely to come. So during 2022, Businesses saw higher employee turnover, burned out employees, and evolving return to work policies. These trends are expected to continue during 2023, and businesses will be faced with a competitive talent landscape, an exhausted workforce, and an increased cost during economic turndown. So what can businesses do? We looked at a recent Harvard Business Review article titled Nine Trends That Will Shape Work in 2023 and Beyond. Um, and this looked at workforce predictions and highlighted aspects of work that leaders and business owners are going to need to incorporate in order to maintain their staff. Um, out of those nine, we took five of the top predictions that those in the construction industry can build upon to help elevate their business above the competition. And when I say construction industry, I'm talking about a very wide encompassing industry um, that involves transportation projects, you know, trucking suppliers, everything of that nature, not just the actual construction portion. So these are the trends. Number one, employers will quiet hire and demand talent. So you may be familiar with the term quiet quitting, and this refers to doing the minimum requirements of one's jobs and putting in no more time or effort or enthusiasm than necessary. This practice leads to organizations keeping people but losing the skills and capabilities because there is no initiative, there's no drive, there's no passion. So organizations need to turn this practice on its head and embrace quiet hiring as a way to acquire new skills and capabilities without adding new full-time employees. 
So in other words, business can consider providing upskilling opportunities to their employees, things like training, mentoring, time for schooling, maybe schooling reimbursement, letting your team attend industry events or development opportunities. Um, these are all things you can do to help increase their capabilities. But you just need to remember that as you add more work onto a person's plate, you also need to compensate them fairly. And you can do that by offering a one-time bonus, raises, additional paid time off, promotions, greater flexibility, or whatever incentive works for you and your organization. And this also plays heavily into retention. You know, you want to keep your employees happy by giving them what they deserve for the work they put in. Pursuant of non-traditional candidates will expand the talent pipelines. So to, to fill critical roles in your firm, you may need to assess candidates solely on the skills they need to perform the role rather than their previous credentials or prior experience. So you can do this by removing formal education experience requirements from job postings. Now, obviously, there are certain jobs in the construction industry that require highly technical skills and certifications, which make it impossible to look past credentials. But there could be some positions within a firm that may allow for on-the-job training or an apprenticeship or for potential employees to learn new skills. Healing pandemic trauma will open paths to sustainable performance. So taking the time to care and check in on your team frequently and build that relationship and trust is paramount. Research shows that employees' stress and worry in 2022 grew even above the 2020 peaks, and that 60% of employees report that they are stressed at their jobs every single day. Not a normal amount of stress, but overly stressed. The Harvard Business Review article stated that the societal, economic, and political turbulence of the last few years is manifesting as decreased productivity and performance, no notice quitting, um, and even increased workplace conflict. So taking the time to show that you care for your team can have these long lasting benefits. Companies must address the workforce wide erosion of social skills. Networking, building relationships and effectively interacting with other human beings is becoming increasingly rare. And research shows that 51% of Gen Z employees say that their education has not prepared them for life in the workflow in the workforce. In addition, the pandemic has also resulted in people not having as many person to person interactions um, or the opportunity to absorb or to observe, excuse me, the normal workforce. So what that means for business owners is that they may need to redefine professionalism in their workforce and understand that there may be a learning curve to what was previously assumed as normal social skills. And lastly, hybrid flexibility would reach the front, front lines. As we enter a more permanent era of hybrid work for desk based employees, we also need to consider the frontline workers as well. These workers are looking for flexibility when it comes to what they work on, who they work with and the amount they work and particularly talking about the stability of their work schedule as well as paid leave. So we need to be creative in providing this flexibility to our frontline workers as well within this industry. Now what these trends look like in your industry and company varies, so it's important to take the lessons that we're talking about here and apply them specifically to your organization. And with that, we're going to switch it over to Elisa to talk about the modern day construction industry. Thank you, Jake. Yes, as Jake just stated, I'm going to speak about the modern day construction industry. Next slide, please, Jake. Thank you. So major investments in infrastructure and energy in the years ahead mean lucrative opportunities for construction firms. And I'm sure this really does not come uh, as a surprise to you, but the construction industry is facing a major worker shortage that will require purposeful actions to reverse. Archaic approaches won't solve the current labor shortage, shortage experts say. And experts are also saying that uh, for people looking for different employment, it's not all about money. Today, employees react to an industry's image, a company's culture, and learning opportunities and technology. So the information for the next few slides is taken from Built, the Bluebeam blog, which is a leading resource for professionals in the architecture, engineering, and construction industries. So the first thing we're going to look at is upgrading construction's image. So for some, some people feel that maybe perhaps the construction industry lacks prestige. And vocational and construction trade schools don't always appeal to the young people of today. Millennials don't realize that construction pays well. They sometimes feel there's a stigma attached to manual labor jobs. And sometimes young people think that college is their only option. 
So what companies need to do is they should develop engagement plans to connect with the community around their job sites. So this plan could include things such as visiting schools and speaking with young people about the opportunities that are available in the industry and um, that these are well paying jobs. Your plan could include doing things such as playing rec recreational sports to get your company name out there, or even sponsoring a sports team, and also participating in charitable causes in your communities, things such as Habitat for Humanity. Construction firms need to help young people realize that a job with them means a career building opportunity. The second thing that you would want to look at is develop an appealing company culture. You need to make sure your workplace is welcoming to people of all types. Diversity doesn't just mean ethnicity, race, gender, and age. It also includes things such as disability, nationality, and veteran, military, marital, or citizenship status. The benefit of multiple perspectives and voices means more people and ideas that help a company innovate. So you wanna look at collaborating on a company vision and values that workers believe in as well. Other things you, you can do are things such as if you get recognition from your customers and or suppliers, you wanna share that. Share that out on your social media, your website, and then also you wanna reward and recognize employees who are living representations of your company's best characteristics. And the third suggestion is to invest in training and technology. Training enhances safety and productivity, attracts and retains employees, and gives both the employees and employer an edge. Technology can also, also help minimize the effects of a labor shortage. Workers of this generation are more likely to want to work for a tech savvy company. So you want to start with looking at a digital hiring process, which Jake is going to be speaking about coming up here shortly. And then you also want to look at extending your technology that you use in your office and on your job sites. Construction technology startup startups are rolling out tools to build structures with fewer trained people, fewer trained workers. For example, using factory made panels, firms can build a home with 10% of the labor force and a much lower cost. Another example is technologies such as building information modeling and augmented reality. And these are things that appeal to Gen Z, which are those people born between the mid to late 1990s and the early 2010s. And now Jake is going to talk about re-engineering the recruitment process. Thanks. So we talked a little bit about the labor shortage, trying to understand what that looks like or why it exists. We talk about what does the modern construction industry look like and how we can you know, attract more talent to it. Um, but now we're going to talk about the recruitment strategy and then the retention followed after that. So the best strategies for recruitment have evolved over many years. Um, however, most companies still employ ineffective and out-of-date processes just on what they have done in the past or what they think they should do. Um, so taking the time to define and augment your recruitment strategy will have a major impact on the people you can reach and the quality of applicants interested in your job. So again, COVID, it's all about COVID, right? So COVID-19 pandemic upended many traditional business practices. Um, and when it comes to recruiting, the crisis has not so much disrupted as accelerated shifts in the talent landscape that were already underway, like I was saying earlier, leaving many companies poorly served by their current hiring practices. So a recent study from research advisory firm Gartner identified several trends in the workforce that we're going to go into and discuss a little bit here. So the first trend is an increasingly short shelf life of skills. So the skills needed in many roles have an increasingly short shelf life, owing in part to more frequent and disruptive technological breakthroughs. So we've hired people based on the ability to do something, and then there's a piece of technology that has come out and automated that we no longer need that person. Their, their skill sets that we originally hired them for are now obsolete. A 2019 survey of 3,500 managers found that only 29% of new hires actually have the skills required for their current roles, let alone future ones. 
It also documents rising uncertainty about what skills will be needed in current and future jobs as the surge in remote work sparks and the redesign of automation of many tasks starts to take place. And what this means is that we need to be seeking potential in individuals versus actual skill sets. And we're going to talk about that a lot, seeking potential versus skill sets. Um, and does an individual an individual have the motivation, the ability to learn new skills and adapt to a constantly evolving industry? That's what we're really looking for. Um, depending on the skills, we can teach them on the job, but the ability to learn and adapt, that is what we're looking for. That's the key piece. So another trend is that routine talent pools are becoming outmoded. The talent pools recruiters have routinely tapped into are becoming outmoded because highly gifted candidates can now be found outside traditional talent clusters, such as leading universities and technical colleges. More and more people are acquiring critical skills informally on the job, or even in their own basements through distance learning. So work lulls and layoffs have driven a boom in virtual learning, giving workers new autonomy in developing skills outside their day jobs. Again, you're looking for these highly motivated people that are willing to learn outside of their their day to day work and apply what they learn in their education to their jobs. How do we source and attract more candidates? Your recruiting process should include strategies for attracting top talent into your pipeline, so you're always prepared with future employees on hand. Um, so these are five things you can do that can really help attract the right people. Make sure your career website and job listings are as clear as possible. You really want to be able to convey what you're looking for in a person and what their expecting expectations are for the job. Encourage your current employees to share company culture with the outside world. We're going to talk about this later, but this is important. You want your employees to feel proud of where they work. You want them to talk about and say good things about your company. You're going to want to attend job fairs and college recruitment events. These are great opportunities to pick up young talent and kind of train them how you want to do the business. Um, and get them started early. Offer a comprehensive compensation package. It's kind of self-explanatory. Hey, benefits, time off. These are things that make your, your posting more competitive. And you're going to keep an eye on your competitors, which we will also touch on a little bit here. And so there's a lot of benefits for, for doing that as well. Another thing to keep in mind is we're identifying people for the long term. Um, it can be hard enough to find candidates in this market. You don't want to make it more difficult by only looking for short short term help and then having to do it again in six months. So when recruiting talent, search for the type of people who would be valuable long term to the organizations, ones that could eventually be executives or leaders or something of that nature. These types of employees, the ones who are engaged and working toward a common goal, um, they're often easier to retain, which saves time and money that you would otherwise have to spend on recruiting. The ultimate goal of recruitment and retention should be always to have a solid pipeline of both internal and external candidates to pull from when the need arises. Um, ones that match your values, that do great work, and that they the ones that respond well to rewards and recognition that your company can provide for them. Promoting a culture of diversity, equity, inclusion. This is huge. The Washington Post recently reported that millennial and Gen Z professional avoid companies without a diverse workforce and a commitment to confronting systemic racism in their ranks. So doing so is not only vital to attract top candidates and drive employee retention, it's also the right thing to do. And prioritizing this diversity, um, equity and inclusion at your organization shows an increased diverse workforce that you care about um, and that you also care about the employee experience and their personal well-being too. Something worth noting here is that the DBE program and small businesses in general, we need to be devoting to changing the workforce climate. The DBE program exists because we were trying to augment women and minority owned companies in a historically white dominated, white male dominated industry. So bringing in new perspectives brings new life to the industry, brings leads to new innovating ideas and technologies and helps grow the industry as a whole. That's why this is so important and why people are putting more of a focus on it. Keep your eye on your competitors. I said we were going to talk about this one. Another recruitment tactic is to keep an eye on you know, your competitors, people you admire, um, other people in the industry as well. Don't look at your competition as your enemy. Look at them as if their employees could soon become your employees. By keeping an eye on your competitors or companies you admire, you'll have some insight into their open and recently filled jobs, which in turn give you some inside knowledge on where they may be headed. Um, why do they fill that role that you're struggling to fill? What is that company offering that you're not offering? The recruitment strategy should incorporate the monitoring of sites like LinkedIn to see where people work, where they're going, um, and even if they're open to new opportunities. You should also be tracking individuals you admire. So when a job does open up that they would be perfect for, you can reach out to them directly and engage their interest. 
The last trend that the Gardner research talked about um, was that candidates are becoming increasingly selective. So in many cases, you have to understand that when you're interviewing an applicant, they are often interviewing the company as well. They have may have six, seven interviews lined up and they want to work for the firm that best meets their needs as well. So you're also being interviewed. That's why firms need a compelling employment value proposition, which can involve anything like competitive compensation benefits, career development opportunities, or even having a reputation for stellar management, which is very important as well. Talented candidates, particularly at high levels, are weighing opportunities differently. These factors such as meaningful work, proximity to family, taken on, um, to have taken on more importance during the pandemic and after the pandemic. And the freedom to work remotely and to manage one's own schedule has increased expectations that employees can exert control over the design of their jobs. Again, this stuff doesn't necessarily translate one to one depending on what your specific company or role you're filling is, but this is what people are expecting when they're in the workforce now. So we need to constantly find ways that we can be creative with it. Um, so especially in a period of high unemployment, the researchers say when people are reluctant to leave a secure position to take a chance on a new one, companies even more so need to offer employee experiences that candidates truly value. Now, I've said this a few times and I'm foot stomping again. We're looking to hire for potential, not necessarily experience. And that's not, it's easier said than done. It's not a one for one swap, but potential and having the ability to learn, work, adapt to work, and be motivated and motivated to self learn is so much more important than just saying, I have 10 years in this industry. Because that doesn't necessarily say you're ready for the future of the industry. It just says you you know a lot of where the industry has come from, which is important, but it doesn't necessarily encompass all of what we're looking for. So stop thinking about hiring a hiring as a matter of replacing a specific employee. When looking to fill a vacancy, too often managers will simply put together a profile mirroring the person who is left and then tack on a few new requirements, which when you think about it, is the equivalent of saying, that you want that entire individual skill set and training and expertise, and then more. You're unlikely going to be able to find that. In best case, even if you do find that person, they're going to not be prepared. They're going to be prepared for yesterday's challenges um, and maybe not for tomorrow's and what's coming next. So HR leaders should push hiring managers to look beyond the immediate needs and consider what skills the larger organization must acquire um, for the future. So lastly, look at it like not who do we need, but what do we need? That's going to help you find that long term person. That's going to help you fill that gap as new technology comes in and as the industry changes, you're going to have the right talent and steam and, and group of people who are able to to adapt to that change. Hey, Jake, we did have a question in the chat from Karen and Karen asked, how do you sign up for a job fair and where? So. Um, not sure where you're located at, Karen, but a couple of ideas or suggestions I have is depending on where you're at, it, you know, you can look at if there are any um, higher education oh, in Mandan. OK, um, any higher education schools, um, you know, possibly um, even Votex. I know schools will host job fairs that you could be a part of. Even checking with your local chamber of commerce. I know our chamber of commerce where I live, they've hosted job fairs in the past. Or possibly, I guess I don't know where you live, if there's um, like the Associated General Contractors. I don't know if they host job fairs or not. Do you know, Jake? Um, yeah, so uh, tons of organizations do it. You can even go to specific schools, high schools, colleges in your area. Um, a lot of times they'll post on their websites because they're trying to get that. Um, they're trying to get businesses to come to their job fairs specifically. Uh, you, a lot of it is just kind of just Googling it, really. Just job fairs near me. And you'll get a whole list of different schools, organizations, um, maybe professional industry affiliated organizations that will have that posted for you. Um, and a lot of times you just it's just sending an email. You may want to even reach out to school department heads ahead of the game and say, hey, I'm interested in, in promoting my business and helping out with a job fair. If, if you have anything coming down the line, let me know. But really what you're looking for with the job fair specifically, it's more catered towards a younger population. So it's going to be your high schools, um, your colleges. Those are what's going to really be putting those on. Job services too, that's another spot. I know <clears throat> here in South Dakota where we're at, some of the different job services through the state um, 
they will have they will host job fairs in their areas that they serve. Yeah. Yep, and then you Good just want to be sure. Yeah, you just want to be sure that when you do go to these job fairs, you're prepared. You know, you want to have folders or papers that really outline exactly what your business is, the position you're looking for. So you want to be able to put your best step forward, because like I said, even at a job fair, especially at a job fair, there's going to be 10, 20, 30, 40, depending on how big it is, there's going to be a lot of companies. So again, all of these people are going to be interviewing your company just as much as you're reaching out to them. So it's not like you have to have these big flashy firework displays that sometimes you see that people have for their companies. Um, but you want to be able to be professional and say, hey, here's exactly what I'm looking for. Here's what I can offer you and be able to you know, sell that package right there on the spot. So make sure that you are prepared when you go to those. Um, with, good question. So yeah, so talked a little bit about the, the recruiting. Now we're going to look at specifically um, modern recruitment techniques. So. These are new and emerging strategies companies can use to find the best talent to fill their open positions. When with technology con continuously advancing, there are more ways recruiters can use these techniques and tools to their advantage when seeking candidates. So again, technology, sometimes it's scary. It's sometimes it seems to be the devil and it's putting people out of work, but you don't want to be fearful of the technology. You want to find ways to make it work for you. How can you implement it into your job, into your company, into your daily life to make it work for you? So we're going to look at nine technology based techniques that you may choose to help you augment your recruitment process, um, depending on your company's individual recruitment needs. The first one is applicant tracking systems. These systems help organize the hiring processes um, process from cradle to grade. Um, and typically they assist with collecting applicant information like resumes or cover letters, organizing candidates and grouping them based on experience or skill sets so you can easily see what their levels are at. Um, and filter applications like separating ones that best meet the job criteria or ones that don't meet the job criteria. This can help recruiters streamline their interviewing hiring process because they can more easily sort through candidates, um, their candidates' credentials and data. You should research different applicant systems and technologies because different ones offer different features, so you want to find one that best suits you. Project Solutions, we use a, a, a software called Jazz HR, which really helps when we get a lot of applicants, helps identify, hey, you have 100 applicants, these 10 may be the ones you want to spend a little bit more time looking at. Number two is artificial intelligence systems. AI systems can help assess candidates and identify potential adjustments to job descriptions. Similar to an applicant tracking system, AI can assist you in filtering job applications that you receive. However, unlike the applicant tracking system, it can also help scan your job descriptions and posts and help you ensure you're using optimized language so that you're not alienating potential candidates based on your description or requir requirements of the role. One of the craziest things to consider is that when we put out a job posting, a lot of people don't respond because of the actual verbiage. Um, and whether it's a conscious or subconscious decision that there's a lot of science behind it, but sometimes people see certain words and they say, oh, they're looking for a person that's not me. So that gets factored in a lot and these systems help kind of filter that out so that you're not alienating people. And this may mean incorporating relevant terms that candidates are looking for, specific terms that they're looking for. If they're, look, if they're a highly motivated person, they may be looking for a job posting that says something about looking for a highly motivated person. These systems are really great because they also allow you to commute directly or communicate directly with applicants through chatbots or automating chat, what's chatting software, which frees up a lot of your time. Um, so basically, if, if someone's asking questions, basic questions that you don't need to spend your time answering, the system can do it automatically. Here's where you apply. Here's the link. Um, here's the document that you need. Number three is video conference interviews. These are becoming more and more popular now, and we're doing a video video right now. So these are these are very important and popular, especially when people aren't living in your area. Um, so using the video conferencing software to speak with candidates can allow you to expand your talent search beyond your business's region. You know, people are willing to 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 move from let's say. Texas and move here, then you can actually do a video software versus them having to move up here or fly up here just to do an interview. When examining different options, you might evaluate different privacy options that software has too. So um, if you're doing an interview and it's a one on one, that's fine, but maybe you're doing an interview with a lot of people or you want to send the interviewee to different departments and talk to different people all in a video setting. Different conference systems can have that. So just again, depending on what you're looking for, there's different things available for you. Social media platforms. So social media platforms have kind of just 
force their way into our lives for better or worse. They're there and people use them. So we might as well take advantage of them. Um, posting your ads and your jobs on, on social media is, is beneficial because it helps you reach potential candidates who may not even be planning on searching for a new position. So you can market your position to a much wider audience and potentially attract more people. Um, this also allows potential candidates to see opportunities for leadership, better benefits or higher pay that might interest them in potentially applying. You can also post on your own account, which helps share your opportunity with your own networks. And everybody has a network. So when you post something, you're also gonna post it to that person's network and that person's network. So it just expands. So the more you can get it out there, the more likely you are to receive positive candidate feedback. The next one is a company reviewing platform. So company reviewing platforms will allow candidates to search for specific companies and learn about what it's like to work there. Potential employees can read former employee experiences and find answers to questions they have, such as, does the company pay extra for overtime work? How do they balance a work-life work -life balance? And what is the workplace culture like? So one of these companies is called Glassdoor, um, which provides job seekers with information about what they can expect at working with at a company. And examining how people discuss your company on platforms that are external to your company is critically important because that's showing how your organization is being portrayed. So earlier we talked about encouraging your employees to share your culture with the world, and this is a great way to do it. Um, as long as you have a healthy culture that people are wanting to hear about, um, encourage your employees to go on Glassdoor. And yeah, if someone's saying, hey, what is it like to work at this company? Here's what it's looked like. They got this great benefits package. They really care about us. They, they put that you know time and effort into our development because the conversation is going to be had whether or not you're part of it or not. So you want to get ahead of it and be a part of that conversation. Online personality surveys. So if finding candidates who fit the culture of your company is a focus on your recruitment strategy, and it absolutely should be, you might use online personality surveys. So these surveys help identify key traits and qualities of each applicant before you interview them. Um, you can provide them with choices that they can answer in their personal lives or in their workplace lives to kind of see where they, you know, what how they best focus or what works best for them in their, their own world. Um, and doing this can provide you with a better understanding of your applicant before you even get to the interview. You know, we keep talking about potential. Surveys are a great way to see if someone has potential versus the skill sets. You know, a resume will show you the skills they have. A survey can show you, well, this is the type of person that strives under pressure, or this is the type of person that is really creative and they love finding new, you know, solutions to challenging problems. So these can also be really beneficial for you. Some of them are really long, some of them are really short. So you're just going to kind of look at them, take one yourself and see how much, you know, how much benefit you see in it depend before you actually implement it. Communication automation. This technology tool helps recruiters program pre-written responses for applicants who may not meet the criteria of the job. And this type of software can be used with data analysis tools to allow these messages to be sent immediately after the analysis software separates applications, and it can save recruiters time and allow them to spend more time speaking with potential candidates who meet the job. So this is basically saying that if you get a lot of applicants and maybe 30% of them are not, not really qualified or wouldn't be the best fit for the role, the system will take care of that for you. It'll say, thank you for applying. Please keep us in you know, mind for future roles and blah, 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 whatever you want to say. But it takes that, that piece of work out of your hands. You know, that's dozens of less emails you have to send back and forth that you don't have to do correspondence. That just doesn't have to happen because it's all automated. And if you're you know, if you're a small firm and you only have like one or two applicants, you're going to want to talk to them each individually. Um, but as you grow and grow and grow and you're getting a lot of applicants or, you know, maybe it's a specifically high part of the season, you're getting a lot of applicants for a certain industry, you may just want to use this to kind of filter through a little bit for you. The next one is mobile application optimization. So this refers to a company optimizing the design and experience of its job application for mobile devices. Having the ability to apply for jobs on a smartphone or tablet may provide candidates with more accessibility and convenience, which allows a person to apply for a job while they're at work, on break, on their couch. Um, you're giving them the opportunity to apply immediately versus making them remember it and go back to it later at a later time. Um, and you want to just make sure it works on all platforms, so Android, Apple, Google, things like that. And the last one is a search engine optimization tool, SEO tool. Um, so these are important to allow potential candidates to find your job posting easily, regardless of how they choose to search for work. Um, they tend to focus on identifying keywords applicants might search um, and incorporate those words into your description. So people can't apply for your job if it's not popping up in their search. 
And these tools help ensure that people are even viewing your postings, um, which is incredibly important because if they don't see it, they can't apply for it. So these are the nine technology-based recruitment strategies. We talked a lot about the recruitment process, the different mindsets and strategies to augment your recruitment capabilities. And now we're gonna go into, once you hire these people, how do you keep them on your team for the long term? Hey, I'm going to speak about effective employee retention. Recruitment and retention strategies go hand in hand when it comes to the success of your organization. Employers and HR leaders need to combine recruitment and retention strategies to find, hire, and keep the best talent for the needs of their business. Happy employees tend to stay at their jobs, and the hiring process needs to take this into account. So you should target and consider hiring new candidates that first understand their roles and job descriptions, have a smooth onboarding process, and match your company culture. And so then that way, their job satisfaction levels stay high. So why are workers leaving? Exit interviews can provide invaluable insight into the employee perspective of your company and help determine whether your, empl your employee retention strategies need improvement. More than likely, you'll hear the departing employee cite one or more of these following reasons for leaving their job. One reason is they may feel the salary is inadequate or that the perks and benefit package isn't competitive. Possibly they could be feeling overworked or unsupported. They could feel they have a limited career advancement at the current company. They may be looking for a better work-life balance. They could feel they have a lack of recognition in their current employment, or they could just sim be simply bored. They could be unhappy with management, or even they could have concerns about the company's direction or financial health. They could be dissatisfied with the company culture, or they may just simply be desiring a change. And, or, and also they could be, um, they could find more compelling job opportunities they believe at another company. While the job market in some industries and regions favors employers, candidates with in-demand skills likely won't have to wait long to find a new opportunity. So here are 12 areas where deliberate action can help boost employees' job satisfaction and increase your ability to hold on to valued workers. So the first, the first suggestion is to just start right at the top with onboarding and orientation. Every new hire should be set up for success from the start. Your onboarding process should teach new employees not only about the job, but also about the company culture and how they can contribute and thrive to it. It's really important that you don't skimp on this critical first step. The training and support you provide from day one, whether that's in person or virtually, can set the tone for the employee's entire tenure at your company. The second area to look at is mentorship programs. Pairing a new employee with the mentor is a great component to add to your extended onboarding process. Mentors can welcome newcomers, newcomers into the company, offer guidance, and be a sounding board. New team members learn the ropes from experienced employees, and in turn, they offer a fresh viewpoint to their mentors. And it's important that you don't just that you don't only limit the mentorship opportunities to your new employees. Your existing staff and your overall employee retention outlook and team's job satisfaction can significantly benefit from mentor-mentee relationships. The third area to look at is employee compensation. It's essential for companies to pay their employees competitive competitive compensation, which means employers need to evaluate and adjust salaries regularly. So even if your business can't increase pay right now, you could consider whether you could provide other forms of compensation, such as maybe bonuses. You also don't want to forget about things such as improving healthcare benefits and retirement plans, which can also help raise employees' job satisfaction. And one type of compensation that is a real big plus right now that a lot of job seekers are looking for is paid paternal leave. 
Next, we'll talk about perks. Perks can make your workplace stand out to the potential new hires and re-engage current staff while boosting employee morale. So one of the most valued perks is flexible scheduling. One example would be allowing workers, um, allowing employees to work a predetermined number of hours within a wide window, such as working any eight hours, 6 a.m. to 7 p.m., or offering a compressed work week. And I do realize that um, we're talking to people within the construction industry, and this perk could be a difficult thing to do, especially when it's peak construction season. But it's just you know one area to look at if you can find a way um, to offer you know any kind of flexible scheduling. In a tight labor market, employers can recruit and recruit and retain employees by offering innovative incentives that go beyond standard benefits. So uh, an example, some examples of innovative incentives would be offering childcare and elder care benefits such as flexible scheduling or accommodating certain time off needs through the Family and Medical Leave Act. Other examples are offering fertility benefits, adoption assistance, home buying assistance such as a Fannie Mae Employer Assisted Housing Down Payment Assistance Program, pet insurance, education benefits, or identity and financial theft protection. And you're probably not going to be able to offer at your company all of those innovative uh, incentives. But even if you just look at even one, that could be something that would set your company apart from another company. The next area is looking at your wellness offerings. Mental health and wellness are a big part of employee health conversations. According to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, one in five adults in the United States live with a mental illness. 25% of American employees report being highly or extremely stressed daily. And 21 million Americans, which is 8.4%, have experienced a major depressive episode. So this is a really important topic. There are a lot of options available to employers who want to boost their mental health and wellness services. In addition to traditional mental health providers, products like Ginger, Mindful, and Talkspace are valuable options employers can consider offering as part of their benefits package. Stress management programs, retirement planning services, and reimbursement for fitness classes are some other examples of wellness options that you could consider offering. The next area to look at is communication. Your direct reports, whether they work on site or remotely, should feel they can come to you with ideas, questions, and concerns at any time. As a leader, you need to make sure you're doing your part to help promote timely, constructive, and positive communication across the entire team. Make sure you proactively connect with each team member on a regular basis to get a sense of their workload and job satisfaction. This next area um, is kind of an extension of that, um, talking about continuous feedback on performance. Many employers are abandoning the annual performance review in favor of more frequent meetings with team members. And these one-on-one -on -one meetings talk with your employees about their short and long-term professional goals and help them visualize their future with the company. While you should never make promises you can't keep, talk through potential career advancement scenarios together and lay out a realistic plan for reaching those goals. Training and development. As part of providing continuous feedback on performance, you can help employees identify areas for professional growth, such as the need to learn new skills. Upskilling your employees is especially important today as technology continues to change how we work. When people upskill, they gain new abilities and competencies as business requirements evolve. So you want to make it a priority to invest in your workers' professional development. This could include giving them time to attend conferences and trainings, providing re tuition reimbursement, or paying for a continuing education. And remember to clearly communicate these types of opportunities as benefits for new employees during the recruitment process, because it will really show that you're willing to invest in your people and it could make people wanna come work for your company. Next is looking at recognition and reward systems. Every person wants to feel appreciated for the work they do. 
an employer's gratitude can make an especially big impact. Be sure to thank your direct reports who go the extra mile and explain how their hard work helps the organization. Some companies set up formal reward systems to incentivize great ideas and innovation, but you can institute compelling recognition programs, even if you have a small team or a limited budget. Work-life balance. What message is your time management sending to employees? Do you expect staff to be available around the clock? People need to know their managers understand they have lives outside of work. You should encourage employees to set boundaries and to take their vacation time. If late nights are necessary to wrap up a project, you could consider giving them extra time off at another time to compensate for that. And again, I know with the construction industry and especially going into the prime construction season, this could be a really hard thing to look at if you've got a lot of tight deadlines with your projects and you know they depend on if you've got to get this done to get another thing done. But work-life balance is something that job seekers is really looking for. So if you can find some kind of innovative way to provide some and, you know, at least know that you're thinking about it and, you know, aware of their needs as well. Effective change management. Beyond all the recent disruption due to the pandemic, every workplace has had to deal with change, good or bad. Employees look to leadership for insight and reassurance during these times. If your organization is going through a big shift, keep your team as informed as possible because it can help ease anxieties and manage the rumor mill. Make big announcements either individually or in a group meeting, group call or meeting, and allow time for questions. And I can speak for experience on this one. I was previously at a company. It was a small company, but they were going through a lot of management changes. And they weren't, they didn't do a good job about keeping everybody in the loop about what was going to be going on. And what resulted was a lot of, um, you know, rumors and just tension and anxiety for the employees. And that wasn't good for anybody. So just, you know, remember to try to keep your team as part of the team and just let them know what's going on if you're able to. And then the final thing to consider is an emphasis on teamwork. Encourage all your employees, not just your star players, to contribute ideas and solutions. Promote teamwork by creating opportunities for collaboration, accommodating individuals' work styles, and giving everyone the latitude to make decisions and course corrections if needed. Seize the opportunity to celebrate milestones and achievements together, such as when the team finishes ahead of the deadline on a major project or a, reach a, work, a worker reaches a work anniversary. So in conclusion, Another you know, suggestion is to take a fresh look at managing retention. So maybe consider shifting the focus of career conversations from promotion to progression and developing in different directions. Consider creating culture and structure that supports career experiments. And what I mean by that is, for instance, maybe you have an employee that's been with your company for quite a while and they're very skilled in one certain area and that's where they've been working. But maybe they've been there for a long time. They're just feeling the job is stale. They want to try something different. So what you want to do is to try to give them the ability to experiment with their career at your company. Try to give them another opportunity to learn a new skill. And that may keep them from looking at a job somewhere else just because they're simply bored and want to learn or try something different. Managers need to be rewarded not for retaining people on their teams, but retaining people and their potential across the entire organization. And I know that can be a hard one because, you know, if you have different teams, everybody wants to keep the people on their teams if they're good workers. But it's more important to keep the bigger picture in mind and retaining the people at your company so they don't want to look elsewhere to go somewhere else. Great. So, so that, oh, go ahead, Jake. I was going to say that that's a lot of information. You know, there's a, a ton in there, recruitment and retention. Like I said, it's something that kind of gets put on the back burner, um, but it's incredibly important and it can really change the trajectory of an organization. 
Um, like Elisa said, and I've said it a few times, not everything in here is going to apply to you. Um, and you may look at some of these things like, there's no way I can do that. I, I don't have that kind of flexibility. Um, but the, the key takeaway is to look at what people are doing, you know, these bigger companies and some of these smaller companies and figure out what can I do? What can I offer that's unique? Something that's going to raise eyebrows and be like, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, and, you know, businesses get really creative. Think outside the box. You know, that's what people want. They want something new and fresh. Um, you know, there are some businesses that one day a year um, they'll they'll hire a, a therapist or a counselor, some sort of mental health expert to come into the organization and everybody can just schedule an hour time to go talk to, to that individual. Um, and, you know, sure, it's an expense, but it's a it's a minor expense compared to offering, you know, these additional benefits of mental health services. You can bring somebody in one day a year um, and there's a lot of really good feedback that comes from that. People appreciate that. Um, you know, some companies do what are called nope days where you get four days a year that you don't have to take time off. You don't have to take sick leave. You can just call in. And as long as it's approved, you say, sorry, it's too beautiful out today. I'm not coming to work. Um, and having four of those a day or four of those a year to a business owner is like four days a year. That's not too much to some to an employee. That's amazing. Four days that I can just call in and, you know, obviously it has to be approved. You know, it can't be a day that we've got a lot going on. Um, but you got to balance that too because they don't want to have to get seven of their note days turned down. Mm -hmm. But that's a very small incentive that actually provides a lot of weight to an employee. They, they see that and they're like, wow, that's awesome. That's really cool. I, I like that this company is doing that. Um, or even saying, hey, I'm going to take you to this event. There's this big conference or something that's going. We're all going. Or I want you guys to go to this one and then you guys can go to this other one. Um, just doing little things like that that are less, not much a huge expense to you, but they really show that you care about your employees and you're putting them first. So, you know, be creative, think outside the box, go online, look at what other companies are doing um, and, and just find ways to really show that you care about the people that are working for you. Because at the end of the day, most people are intrinsically motivated. They want to feel that what they're doing is important and that they're cared about. And if they just seem like they're just an employee that could be replaced like that, then they're going to go. They're going to find a company. Or they're going to find a manager. They're going to find a CEO. They're going to find somebody who actually values what they're doing. And that's going to help motivate them to be bigger and better at your company. So are there any other questions or anything in, on anyone's mind now? Good. I'm glad the information was helpful. If you want more information, you can always reach out to us. There's the phone number right there, 605-737-0377. Um, don't hesitate to reach out, even if you want some more specific ideas or you want to throw some ideas around and, and see what may work or, or, or whatever. We're always available here all the time. So um, thank you for attending. Um, if you're interested in that bipartisan one, go sign up for that one as well. That's going to be on Thursday at the same time. Um, and if there's no other questions, thanks again, and hope you guys have a great day.